Okay, so um, let's go to uh, Bouvet a couple of years ago, 2018. And uh, thanks for inviting me. It's fun to be here. And I know uh, several guys uh, quite well. And uh, it's good to see some old Minnesota guys and Wisconsin guys on, on here too. So uh, anyway, um, here we go. Well, the good part is the team. We had a very good uh, cordial team and uh, they're all really good friends. The bad was, as you would expect, the weather. It was uh, pretty miserable. There's Bouvet on a nice day. And uh, sometimes the bad got really bad. And the ugly was the Batanzos, the, the, the ship we uh, took to Bouvet. Um, not much has changed on the DXCC most wanted list. Um, since then, except Baker is uh, way down the list now, but it, those below it have moved up a notch, but it really hasn't changed much. It's still uh, number two. Um, some places uh, some places it's number one, some places uh, North Korea is number two. But it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's they say it's the most isolated spot on the planet. Um, you can see it's quite a ways from the tip of South America and South Africa, and it's even still a thousand miles north of uh, Antarctica. It's a very foreboding place. It's very rugged. Um, it's an extinct volcano that's uh, almost 100% covered by glacier. There's no real beach anywhere. Um, there's one small beach that's off limits uh, because of that. that's the only place that wildlife can gather. And if you look at uh, the weather, there's 300 storms a year. And if you look at Antarctica, this isn't a good map of Antarctica, but uh, because it's just the rectangular format, but there's these hurricanes or what they call in the Southern Hemisphere cyclones that just circle Antarctica around and around and around. And of course, Bouvet is right in their path. And 65% of the time, I mean, all year round, the wind is greater than gale force wind. Uh, so it's a very windy place. And uh, it's, it's, it's rare to get a calm day on Bouvet. And these are some pictures from a 2006 mountaineering expedition on a calm day. You can see the water, it's fairly calm, but uh, because it's so windy in that area, um, the, the swells still continue. And uh, this is what it's like uh, in a beach landing area on a calm day on Bouvet. So that's really gonna be a tough thing to do is to land on uh, on the beach, but again, that's off limits. And the, really the helicopter is the only safe way to do a, a landing there. And as you can imagine, planning for one of these expeditions is quite complex. The logistics, you know, everything has to be planned out literally a year or two in advance. Um, there's all kinds of uh, legal things uh, for uh, uh, permission and uh, environmental things. Uh, and then when you get at your um, takeoff point, um, you got to worry about the safe transportation and in this part of the world, the convergence zone, the Drake Passage, as we all know, is uh, very uh, treacherous and, and unpleasant. And then can you make a safe landing and can you even get off? You know, when they went to Peter One, there were some times, uh, I think it was three or four days, uh, several guys got stranded before they could extract them. Um, and selecting a team that's cordial and works together and has everybody's back, that's very, very important too. So we put out a, an, uh, uh, an ad to join our team. You know, you got to be young and skinny and wiry and, and uh, you know, orphans are preferred. But the most important thing is you got to know CW and FT8. Well, most of us left that, uh, that were from the U.S. left uh, on January 9th. This is in early 2018. And uh, we arrived in the Punta Arenas uh, in the evening of uh, January 10th. And this was no small investment um, for each team member. As you can see, you know, we had uh, probably a minimum of $25,000 invested in this trip. So we had a lot, a lot in personal stake in the success of this expedition. And uh, uh, you know, being prepared, there's no radio shack and there's no uh, drugstore around the corner. So uh, we really have to uh, pack carefully and take everything that we need and uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a job to get everything packed to go on a trip like this. 
then what if something runs out and you need uh, plan B? You know, what, what is plan B? Well, on a place like this, uh, if you're really compulsive, like uh, most of us are that, that plan these, um, you're extra prepared uh, for uh, uh, any circumstance, you know, what ha might happen. So um, there's a redundancy and redundancy to redundancy planning and, uh, you know, nothing is left uh, uncovered. Well, anyway, the original plan was after arriving on January 10th, we'd have a couple of days of crew training and safety training, and then board the ship on the 13th of January, and then arrive at Bouvet about two and a half weeks later, be there about three weeks, and uh, literally be home for the, for the spring. While we were flying, um, the State Department issued this warning that, uh, you know, there's really not much that they could do to help us uh, um, if we got stranded in the in the Antarctic somewhere. Um, anyway, during our crew training, we uh, learned the systems of the ship and uh, how it worked. And uh, um, it was, you know, for us, for a land lover like me, it was uh, very, uh, very educational. We even had CPR and all kinds of safety training. Uh, we got to uh, practice uh, uh, survival suits, which uh, actually was quite fun. And they're actually quite comfortable, um, but uh, it was, uh, some things I've never done before. We also had uh, fire training, safety fire training, and. Uh... I don't know if you can hear me with the audio, but I always make sure your fire. know that we'd be uh, using some of this stuff later. Anyway, if you've never handled a fire hose, that's an experience in itself too. And uh, I'm glad we got to do that. But uh, it really gave us an appreciation for uh, all the safety things that are used on a ship like that. We even had uh, respirator training um, uh, in case there was smoke and things like that. Well, January 13th came, the morning we were supposed to board the ship and uh, they said, we're not quite ready. And so we had been staying in this um, Captain Cook Hotel, uh, which was really nice. And uh, because of our, our reservations were only for those days, uh, we had to move out and uh, ADAP, uh, the company that uh, uh, had the, owned the Botanzos, put us up in this uh, hotel called the Yellow Submarine. And we, all of us realized that they called it the Yellow Submarine because it was a <clears throat> dive. Well, it wasn't that bad, but it was just the basics and there really wasn't a lot of privacy, but uh, and it was fairly clean and had fairly good food. Punta Arenas is a beautiful city. We had several days to explore the town and uh, um, it was uh, very, very, uh, it's a very beautiful city. Um, very friendly people. And uh, this is our ship. Um, DAP is, uh, stands for Developing Antarctic Projects. And uh, they have an airline uh, and they, they bought this ship at, uh, well, I'll go back a little bit, but why did we come up with this ship? The Braveheart was willing, but they had limited landing capability and uh, uh, they could take a helicopter. They had a very small pad for it, but the helicopter would have to be shipped from New Zealand to South Africa and then back. There would be no backup. It'd be quite expensive. And actually, Nigel Jolly helped us find DAP and the Batanzos. It was a larger ship, and it had two bigger, two helicopters that were much bigger than uh, what the Braveheart could handle. Anyway, this was a 45-year-old ship. DAP had purchased it for a couple million dollars from a bankruptcy, and it had spent two years in dry dock. And uh, their purpose for getting the ship was to service the all of the sub-Antarctic bases that the various countries have down there. And... Uh, uh, you know, take supplies, remove trash, and uh, they were scheduled to put it in the water in uh, September of 2017. They had all kinds of uh, expeditions planned, um, but uh, they all had to be canceled, and um, it didn't actually get put in the water until mid-December, about a month, about three weeks before we got there. Anyway, this is the ship, the Batanzos. You'll see it later. 
here we are taking off from uh, Punta Arenas and uh, it's kind of listing to one side because uh, all the fuel on one side kind of makes it list a little bit that way. Um, but uh, we had lots of uh, fuel for the generators. Most of that's uh, aviation or abgas for the, for the helicopters. There's a fairly good sized helicopter deck with two helicopters. And uh, we live down below deck. Um, the, this is the state room area. And uh, this is uh, one of the rooms. We had bunk rooms. There were two or three people in a room. And uh, it was fairly nice and clean. This was a living room and uh, where we watched movies and sat around and talked. To the right of this room was a little mini theater uh, where we had our uh, station set up uh, where we operated Maritime Mobile. And on the other side of that room was a little conference room that uh, we used occasionally for meetings. Uh, it was fairly good food on the ship if you were up to having an appetite uh, after to roll it around in the seas. As you can see some guys here really weren't uh, eating much of anything, but others were chowing down pretty good. So finally, we set sail about a week or 10 days after uh, we were supposed to, and we made pretty good progress uh, past the Falkland Islands. And uh, they were still working on the ship, getting some safety railing installed. And uh, they were, we were gonna have our meals downstairs in one of those areas, but uh, they never could get the food elevator working. And some of the electrical outlets didn't work. And some of the rooms didn't have heaters. Um, they were still working on the ship, um, even while we were underway. We saw some, uh, rare wildlife, uh, the panda dolphin. Of course, the, the albatrosses were with us all the time, some really nice sunsets. Then we started to see some icebergs as we got farther uh, east and we went past uh, South Georgia and uh, uh, really a beautiful place. Lots of whales and uh, uh, saw a big sperm whale that was just huge and uh, uh, you know, some guys thought, well, maybe there's jaws around here. Well, that didn't happen. But anyway, in this, the ship had been a, a, a fishing factory uh, for Antarctica. And they'd taken off tons of equipment, uh, literally many, many tons of equipment. And so the ship was actually fairly high in the water and it moved around a lot. I mean, it really was unstable and bobbed a lot from side to side. And uh, down in the main hold, we, you can see some of our shelters and some of our antennas. But uh, for the most part, the ship was pretty light, really. Uh, there was enough room in there. Uh, many of the guys hadn't seen how these shelters went together. And uh, so we assembled a shelter and uh, took it down so uh, we, they could see how uh, they went up and took down. And there's the, the, the John that was on uh, Peter One Island many years ago. And when we asked them how they were gonna take our stuff to the island, they said by helicopter, but you know they had no nets or cargo things. So while we were underway, they actually made these nets for, you know, for the, to carry the cargo ashore. So they really didn't have that uh, on board. They made them while, uh, while we were at sea. And of course, when you know, on the ISO lines on the weather chart get close together, it means bad weather. And um, you know, when we got into the colder waters and the wind, you know, it was, uh, thank goodness we had radar. Some of the radars quit working intermittently, but uh, at, at least we had one going all the time. And you can see the wind blowing here. Um, and uh, this iceberg, you can just see the waves go up. I, I think it was this one. And you know, then it's out of sight, but uh, um, pretty rough seas. And we let, you know, rolled back and forth, you know, 30 degrees was not uncommon at all. And you'll see later um, how unstable it can be. And some of the guys, one got, one, at one night, it was pretty stormy, and I think it was Ralph said he saw this this needle pegged uh, from side to side. Um, so we rocked and rolled quite a bit. And the biggest problem is when you're in your bunk, which was uh, perpendicular to the boat, you just slide back and forth, back and forth in your bunk, and you almost get skin burns, you know, carpet burns, you know. So you would learn to wedge yourself in so you wouldn't 
slide while the ship was rocking back and forth. Well, look at these portals. This, these are the, the, the windows in our state rooms. And uh, this is what it was like uh, looking out the windows a lot of the time. So you can see you know, how much of that ship was rolling from side to side. And you can see we slowed up for some icebergs or storms uh, at different times. There were some huge icebergs that, uh, that we would come across. And then we had these little burglets that would uh, hit the side of the ship and make a good clunking sound uh, just outside your, your cabin window. Then we had... Uh, uh, our briefings on how we were going to deploy our staging, you know, uh, who would go uh, and what would happen. And, uh, you know, we went over this several times and everybody had assignments. And uh, some of us were kind of seasick most of the time. So what is Glenn staring at there on the wall anyway? So anyway, um, the helicopters have a rating of, you know, about five degrees of tilt. And if you get more than five degrees of tilt, you can have what's called dynamic rollover. And uh, so the ship has to be fairly stable during that time. And if the helicopter starts to tip over, that lateral horizontal thrust in just increases um, quite rapidly sometimes. So this is what dynamic rollover uh, looks like. And that's why the, the helicopter pilots were I'll say not too enthusiastic about flying the helicopters in, the, in a ship that was moving like ours was. So you can see that happens on stable ground. And when you're on a rocking platform that's going back and forth, that can happen really, really fast. So anyway, um, this is not our ship, but uh, this is what it was like on some days with the furniture. This is the living room before a storm. And uh, after a good storm, it kind of looks like this. Things kind of get piled up and broken. And um, 
it's it's not a pretty sight. And then after some of the storms, we got leaks. Almost every stateroom, state room, bunk room, whatever you want to call it, had leaks. You know, water leaked in, and it always wasn't very pleasant. You know, this is dirty water. It's it's not septic, but it's the the gray water line that they were the ones that seemed to leak. Uh, for whatever reason. So this stinky stuff just kind of got saturated in all our stuff, you know, trying to get rid of that stuff, you know, is just almost impossible. And so sometimes they put on some tape and use the heat gun to kind of seal it, shrink it to stop the leaks, but still we had leaks that uh, happened all the time. And then during one storm, um, some guys were kind of watching TV and their feet got wet. And uh, a the living room filled up with this uh, gray water stuff and uh, it came from a, a pipe that had been covered up and somehow some seawater got in there and it was, again, it was not a pleasant uh, smelling experience to say the least from this old fishery. Well, anyway, there are lots of problems, you know, uh, watertight compartments weren't, it was noisy, the, we could had a lot of fumes from the engine compartment and uh, um, Sometimes it wouldn't be any hot water, sometimes no cold water, sometimes it'd be brown water. And, uh, it, you know, there were lots of deficiencies that we found. And a few days before we got there, there was a big earthquake. Um, we didn't feel a tsunami or anything like that, but there was a 6.6 .6 just a few miles away from Bouvet. And of course, you know, when you're rocking and rolling in those storms, you start to feel kind of sick. And, uh, uh, you know, I was probably the sickest puppy of all during the whole trip. Uh, I just don't do those things well. I thought I'd get myself over it and, and fight it, but I just, you know, sometimes you can't. So I, I learned to speak porcelain pretty well. This, this is one of my best friends here. Um, and you can see the floor is kind of wet there. And uh, it, it's not because of misses, but, um, but you know, when you're, uh, when you sit down on one of these things and and do a good job and, and then Anyway, that's that's what life was like in the bathroom. Um, it, the toilet would talk back to you. So some of the guys moved their stuff into uh, one of the conference rooms to help dry their things out. And uh, you know things were always damp. We had to keep the windows closed because you couldn't open the, the windows to ventilate things out. So you know, things started to smell after a while. Anyway, we arrived late in the afternoon on January 31st, and. Uh, we went to the leeward side of the island because there were, there were 80 mile an hour winds. We never did make facial contact with the uh, Norwegian uh, science team, which um, is over here in this area somewhere. Um, we never did uh, see them, but we talked to them on the marine radio. And they said that when we arrived, there were 40 and 50 foot breakers uh, coming in right below them. And uh, uh, that's wind stayed that way all night while we were there. And here's what the radar looked like after we got there. You can see Bouvet on the left and you can see all the icebergs and things in the water are those uh, dots around the, in the radar screen there. So lots of icebergs and uh, pretty windy. <laughs> I don't know how big those swells were, but um, um, you know, it just it's just uncomfortable. You can't really do much in those uh, swells. But you know, it's a beautiful place when you can see it, and the weather can change from that to this just uh, literally in just a minute or two. It's just amazing how quickly things can just close in there, and uh, you know, you have a nice clear mountain view, and then the fog and the clouds roll in like this, and then just a few minutes later, it's pouring rain or snowing, sleeting, whatever, uh, you know, just zero visibility. So these things, uh, you know, if you're flying a, a helicopter, it just, I mean, you could be in 
in uh, I, you'd be IFR in just minutes, you know. Anyway, when it's clear, it really is nice. Uh, you can see there's almost no beaches at all. And, you know, if you want to take a freshwater shower in this waterfall, there's hunks of ice falling down. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very rugged coastline. And this little saddle here is where Mark, uh, ON4WW, had planned on camping for uh, two or three months, getting dropped off and then picked up two or three months later to uh, do a one-man operation. And uh, the winds just come across there just like, it, just howling. And, you know, it would have been a, a, a suicide mission, I'm sure. And Bouvet is like an airfoil. You know, this, most of these pictures are from the east side of the island, the leeward side. And the wind comes from the west and it goes over the top and just comes right down to the water. So even though you're on the leeward side, right up by the shore, um, there's wind um, just because it comes over the island like an airfoil, right, right down to the ground or the sea, I guess. And if you're going to climb up these cliffs, like Dom has proposed to do, there's uh, some places, uh, and you can't see them from below, but there's these crevasses that sometimes go up for almost a mile. So uh, it's not really a, a safe place just to be uh, walking around. And, you know, the storm, after we got there, even got worse. Um, uh, it, it was really really bad and we were pretty miserable. There was a, an iceberg uh, that went by. It took a, just a few hours to go by with, because of the wind, but it was uh, uh, quite a big one. I don't know where it ended up, but uh, uh, fortunately we didn't uh, get too close to it. So we were at anchor on February 2nd and uh, uh, No Deer made a nice little video and that will bring us up to this point uh, in time. So uh, here's, here's No Deer's uh, video.
We had our gear all lined up, ready to go uh, uh, to the island um, at a moment's notice. Um, so we were all, all ready to go. And uh, the second day after that video, uh, we had a two hour fine window that was missed. We just couldn't get the, the pilots going. Um, we could have gotten a dozen flights in and some basic infrastructure there on the island. And uh, the rest of the day uh, was just like this, you know, low ceiling, you know, it just wasn't fine weather at all. The next day at 4 a.m., uh, the days are really long there, um, the winds were light and variable. It was almost perfectly blue sky, good visibilities, um, and the seas were calm. The ship wasn't rolling much, but there were no pilots, no mechanics. There was no one around except two or three of us on the crew, and we woke each other up to get, get ready to go because we thought we'd be on the island in just an hour or two. The helicopters were covered, you know, and nobody was around, and um, it was a beautiful day, um, uh, just like this, uh, you know, for several hours. And and you can see there were no white caps. It was a nice day. We weren't rolling too much. I mean, we could have gotten on there and got some things set up and, uh, this is right in the center of the picture in that little flat area over that little rise, that horizontal dark line in the middle. That's where we we're going to set up camp, you know, relatively flat area. Um, even, you know, a couple hours later, it was still nice. It was starting to cloud up. You can see some clouds on the other side. And, uh, you know, the weather got better and better. And at 7.30, the pilot said, we need to have breakfast first. And then the Zodiac started to get moved. And, and then an hour later, you know, uh, the weather closed in and we, we lost that four hour window. You know, we could have had another almost two dozen flights in and uh, most of the team and infrastructure on the island, but we lost that opportunity. A second one lost. And then on Bouvet, you, you can't expect anything better. It just, there's just going to be windows of opportunity. There's no good days because there is there are no good days. There's only windows of, of, uh, of uh, you know, good weather where you can fly. So we got the pilots sat down and said, we need to have a talk. And so we explained to them, you know, you know, what our minimal infrastructure was and what it needed and, you know, how many flights and, you know, we were pretty well organized how things are going to go out. And they looked at us and they said, uh, you know, well, um, you know, we need 24 hours of clear weather for a recon flight. You know, we need breakfast before we fly. There's blue ice, whatever that is on the island. The ship has to be rolling less than five degrees. You guys sure have a lot of stuff. And you got to get the stuff out of the holds and you need a new plan on and on and on and on. And Bob and Jim were sitting there and I know what Bob is thinking. Yeah, these guys really don't want to fly. Um, so, and I'm sure that's, uh, uh, that was the case. But uh, anyway, this is, we missed some of those opportunities. And uh, the next day the winds picked up you know, um, it just wasn't flying weather again. And um, it, it got so windy um, that two anchors couldn't hold the position of the ship. So uh, we pulled up anchor and, uh, and the reason is you can see there about just over halfway down that the winds were, you know, gusting 75, 80 miles an hour. So, I mean, it just, you just can't hold, um, hold your position with anchors like that. They'll just pull out. So we were about midnight. I was about the only one awake. I was reading, trying to read anyway. And we were under power, trying to hold position, you know, near the island, keep away from the icebergs. And I smelled smoke. And uh, um, I mean, it just came on all at once, just smoke uh, throughout, you know, our, our little cabin. And I went outside and uh, um, I went to uh, pull the, the smoke alarm and, and nothing happened or the fire alarm, nothing happened. The smoke alarm hadn't gone off. And so I knocked on the room next door. They were waking up and we 
couldn't communicate with the bridge until we got the marine radio out and there was a language barrier they couldn't understand why we were so excited at midnight um, but uh, finally they realized there was a, a fire in the engine room and so we all met at our mustering uh, spot uh, where we're supposed to meet if there was an emergency or fire or something like that um, just like we were supposed to we had our survival gear on and uh, you wonder what Hal is looking at here and just Underneath us is where this fire is, and underneath that is all this fuel, you know, that who knows what's going to happen. So we didn't, you know, it was it was fairly hair raising to say the least, uh, um, with all this fuel. And our and the the lifeboat uh, hadn't been stocked yet; they hadn't gotten around to that, so it was a, totally an empty lifeboat. Um, but anyway, um, it was an engine fire, not really an engine fire, but if you look at the ship. Uh, between the engine and the transmission, there's a coupling, and this coupling just overheated and uh, and burned up. And there's some material in there just stunk to high heaven. It, it was just really a, a, a noxious smell. Um, and so we kind of bounced around there while they were getting things under control. And um, again, it was you know midnight, 1 a.m. and Finally, about 2 a.m., they let us come inside upstairs, and we had all the, the windows open, uh, trying to get all the smoke and fumes out. Um, but we could smell that for, uh, for hours after that, uh, with all the windows open and the ventilation system going. And later on in the trip, um, one of the guys uh, took down the, the smoke alarm, and obviously it wasn't going to work because this is uh, what they found inside, and it was uh, from, that, from the leaks we had during those storms. So the smoke detectors weren't working at all. And at dawn the next day, you know, there were severe storms predicted for the next four days. And even with a single engine, it was almost impossible to hold our position. And if, if it was a second failure, you know, we could run aground, hit icebergs. If the team was on the island, uh, could we even extract them? Um, uh, how would that work? And so the captain declared that uh, the mission was aborted for safety. And so we headed back toward Chile uh, with one engine going about uh, five or six knots. Uh, um, but we were headed into the wind, into the current. And uh, it, at that rate, it would take us uh, about five weeks to get back to Punta Arenas. Um, and, you know, it was going to be a long trip back. And then day five, um, I was awoken. Uh, at 6.45, you know, I was, everybody was sleeping and same thing, you know, just exactly the same thing. Um, more that same smoke, um, that horrific, horrific odor and uh, another engine fire. Um, but the other coupling failed on the other engine. And so we were actually adrift for several hours and they, somehow they found a spare coupling that just happened to be, they hadn't gotten it, gotten rid of it yet uh, when they were uh, doing all the maintenance on the ship. So the captain decided to head to Cape Town because he had to run that coupling pretty, pretty quiet. Um, so we went downwind and with the current and trying to avoid the ice fields. And you can see here where we changed direction and going a lot slower than when we arrived. So what else could happen? Well, you know, if there's a fire and smoke alarm goes off in the engine room, um, the CO2 is supposed to go off and put out the fire. But fortunately, that didn't work. Um, and if it would have, I probably wouldn't be here today because, um, you know, there really wasn't any barrier between the engine room and our staterooms. You know, just the CO2 would have gone up into the rooms. You know, that, that's it. And so it's, that's one good thing that didn't work was were the CO2 fire extinguishers. And so we headed to Cape Town, 1900 miles away with one engine going about two or three knots. And with the, the current, we were making maybe four or five knots. So what else could go wrong? Well, somebody on uh, Facebook said, notice this little kink in our path and what's going on now? Well, you know, we were rowing as ha hard as we could, but that's actually when we had aerobic knives. No, um, anyway, um, what happened there was the engine manifold failed that, that cools the engine. It draws in seawater, cools the engine, and then it, then it expels it. 
and uh, that failed. Actually, that was the second time that it failed um, on that engine uh, during this trip. So anyway, they got that fixed finally, and uh, we got going again, just skirting around pretty close to some of these icebergs. And it did get a little bit warmer as the days, uh, as we headed north. And uh, uh, I even got a picture of the green flash one sunset. I don't know how many have ever seen that while they're at sea, but uh, that doesn't happen very often. Anyway, to keep busy, you know, clean up the toilets, but they would still erupt, you know, if it was uh, the slightest bit bumpy and, uh, um, you know, the dryers didn't work after we did our laundry. And, uh, you know, it, it was, there were a lot, it was really boring going back that slow, you know, what, literally walking 2,000 miles at, you know, going 2,000 miles at walking pace or a little bit slower, it's going to take a long time. Anyway, had group pictures, um, had a chance to do that, but inside, unfortunately, no bouvet in the picture, but uh, at least uh, we got our team picture and flags taken. And, you know, during the daytime, we'd run three or four knots and a little bit slower at night just because of icebergs. Got a lot of radio time in, read a lot of books. And as it got warmer, um, we shed uh, more clothes each day. There wasn't any internet to keep us entertained. And we tried to get reservations home. And with the sat phones, you know, they're really slow. And by the time you're on hold and, and somebody comes to help you, you've lost your connection. And uh, we had this very rudimentary email system. It was text only. And uh, if we did upload pictures, it would take hours to do you know, just a single picture. So usually what we did, we called our families and had them make our reservations after explaining uh, the situation to them. So we played a lot of radio. We had a vertical Hustler vertical antenna um, and uh, a fan dipole that covered several bands. And uh, a lot of times the bands were dead. You can see uh, Jim here, uh, uh, a dead band, then looking over at Jerry to see if he has any activity. So we played our radio, made 10,000 contacts, Maritime Mobile, and most of them were CW and FT8, and just three sideband contacts is all. So as we got close, this is probably the only picture of me smiling as I could see uh, uh, South Africa um, in the distance. Um, that was a relief to see that because we knew we were getting, a, we had survived and we we're gonna be going home. So there's Cape Town, the tip of South Africa. And uh, listen to the horns here as uh, this boat comes to meet us. So they were calling CQ with a trumpet. Um, so that was a South African uh, radio league that uh, came out to meet us and a uh, bunch of great guys. So there's a Table Mountain in uh, Cape Town that it's famous for. And uh, we finally got into the harbor and uh, poor No Deer uh, was unable to go ashore because he didn't have a, um, a visa for South Africa. We didn't know we were going to go to South Africa. So he had to stay on boat until uh, his plane was ready. And uh, then they, uh, the police actually escorted him to the airport. So. We had contracted to be at the island uh, 21 days, not on the island, but to be there for 21 days. And, you know, if we stayed extra, there'd, there'd be an overtime charge. But DAP gave us, uh, we think, a, a fairly fair and equitable partial refund. Uh, they reimbursed us for the helicopter hours and unused fuel, and they paid for our lodging and airfare home. And as you know, we, everybody got back about 40% of what they put in. So anyway, it took them six weeks to get the repairs done for the Batanzos. And they arrived back in Chile. You know, they left in January and got back the end of April. And uh, then they unloaded the two 20-foot containers into our 40-foot container. And with all the customs and logistics involved, that six months later, um, our container arrived back home. So... What are the plans now? Dom says he's still going. At one time, he was going to take a sailboat. And then there was an Atlantic tuna. And I think that's fallen through. I don't know what his plans are. He still says he's going um, this fall. Um, he's 
and he says he's planning to scale the glacial cliff. And you saw what that was like. You know, I hope it's not a, a disaster, but uh, we never hope that for anybody. But you know, it would be nice if he could get there. Um, the three Y zero J, you know, they were well funded and well organized, but because of the COVID uh, situation, the Braveheart uh, had to sell, and most of the ref all well all the refunds uh, were given back. Everybody got their refunds. Um, and as of yesterday, I heard they found another vessel. I know absolutely nothing about it. They're making a reapplication uh, for Norway. Um, so I guess we just have to stay tuned for that operation. And I'm sure there'll be more details coming. Um, so uh, that's probably going to be in early 2023. I will just no, hear more about that later, I'm sure. Anyway. This is us, you know, and this is Bouvet, and we were all prepared, and uh, we never did get that piece of cheese because safety came first. And, uh, you know, yeah, I guess you could say it was a good learning experience. And one thing we learned that Bouvet weather is just roulette. Uh, I mean, it just, there's just short windows of opportunity. And we thought we had a big boat, but it certainly could have been more stable. A bigger helicopter would be nicer too, and and to really have a minimal viable configuration because your windows are so short, um, and you know the more stuff you have, there's just more chance of things to go wrong and not have, getting the things that you need uh, on the island. And you know, I, we all learned that Bouvet is a very dangerous place. There's never good weather. There's only just little windows. Some people say summer may be better there. Some people say winter may be better, but there's more ice pack. Shore landings are impossible. And if you really want to see a good video on how tough it is to land on Bouvet, um, Google three days on Bouvet and then translate it to uh, Norwegian. And there's a, about an hour plus video that comes up. That's It's a fascinating video taken by those mountaineers. Anyway, when you go on an expedition like this, there's it's a stool with three legs. There's a team and equipment, there's finances and transportation. If any one of those fails, the whole mission fails. You know, they're all interdependent. And on our trip home, you know, we realized that our lives were in peril several times. I mean, it was, it was pretty sobering. And you can't make any assumptions about transportation. And, you know, you need battle-tested reliability. What the Navy does when they have put a ship to sea. Um, you know, they do the sea trials and the shakedown crews, and then they fix everything that was broken or breaks and didn't work right. Then they do it again, and then a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, you know, to get it battle tested. Uh, so things don't break, and so things work. And, you know, just projects like that, uh, you know, like refurbishing the ship two years in dry dock, you know, it just, you know, maybe a year later would have been a better year. Things would have worked, you know, um, but, you know, like a lot of these disasters, one little step, you know, you get one step closer once, you know, you, you get kind of past the point of no return and you're committed, you know, and you should have said uncle a long time ago. And, you know, are we getting too old for doing some of these? You know, we, I think all of us age quite a bit on this trip. And there's a movie called uh, No Country for Old Men. And I think that's a movie about Bouvet. Anyway. The last reflection was, you know, the really sobering value of life and loved ones back home because, uh, um, you know, when our lives were in, I mean, we had no idea what was going to happen, you know, when those fires broke out and when we were stranded and just, you know, when all the engines are stopped and it's really quiet and you're adrift at sea with some icebergs around, it's, it can be kind of nerve wracking. So in summary, the good is the team, it was well organized, well financed. The bad, of course, was the weather and the seas as expected, and the ugly was the Batanzos. It was probably inadequately vetted and certainly didn't have its shakedown crews under control, and um, the mission was aborted for, like, safe, for safety first. Remember the phrase, Houston, we have a problem for Apollo 13 when they uh, um, had that uh, trouble. You know, they were uh, um, going around the moon. They made a slingshot uh, approach around the, the moon and finally made it home. And it was called a successful failure. And I guess that's what you would call us. We failed in our mission to activate Bouvet, but it was successful in all of us getting home alive. So, you know, they said it would be fun, but uh, I don't know if it really was or not. 
And uh, I know I'm not going back. Who wants to go on the next attempt? I think uh, maybe I, I've shown you a little bit what it's like going to places like that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been on Batanzos. I have no desire to, I don't think any of us on this trip have any desire to go back to Bouvet because we've, we've seen it and what it's like there. And, uh, you know, anybody that, that goes there, um, boy, they, they deserve our prayers and support. And uh, uh, I hope they can pull it off. And that's why these places are rare. That's why it's at, you know, at the very top of the most wanted list because they are so unattainable and so miserable to go to. Anyway, we thank you for your support uh, that you uh, gave us. And I wanna mention Northern California DX Foundation for their, their huge contribution and uh, for you guys for supporting us so well. So thank you and uh, uh, for your support and prayers, concerns as we uh, limped our way home.